Okay, here we go. Does that mean we're starting? That was the That's intro. the intro? Here we that go. That was the intro. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Welcome back. This is the Behind the Well Show with Roger Abel, Elias Randall. Elias, we're going to talk about top financial mistakes people have made in the past. And here's what I like about this topic. I think most people in life can learn a lot from the mistakes of the past. So today we're going to talk about mistakes that people have made or admitted that they they made and how maybe you can learn from that so you don't repeat that same mistake. And it's okay to make mistakes. It happens. It's all part of the maturing and learning in life. The The goal is here, if we can help somebody avoid a very, very costly mistake. There's different mistakes, right? There's a mistake that I ran the red light and I got in a car accident. And then there's the mistake that I drove off a bridge. Yeah, one's kind of a boo-boo and one's pretty dangerous. You got it. So uh today let's talk let's just start elias with the three biggest income mistakes that retirees make what do you think what do you think the biggest one is without looking at the slide what do i think the biggest income mistake is yeah uh for people not working with a planner i bet not having enough cash in your portfolio is probably the biggest income mistake you make are you talking about actually the money coming out yeah, like the cost of really more the cost in retirement. So I'll I'll just kick it off, and it's one assuming that your housing costs will be minimal. Most people, I think, underestimate their housing costs. So if I asked you, Elias, what's what's it cost every month for you to be in your house? What would you tell me for the mortgage payment? It's like thirteen hundred bucks a month. Just all of your house costs. What would you tell me? All of the cost to be in your home. What would you tell me? Oh. I'm sure my wife has it written down somewhere, but I honestly don't know. Okay, most people, though, they're going to say, well, my mortgage payment, if they have one, taxes, insurance, heat, electric, and just random utilities. That's what they tell you when you do a financial plan. How many budgets have we had come in here? This is what my housing cost is. Guess what they left out? The air conditioner went out, tree removal, insurance deductibles, Gas for the lawnmower. Washing machine went out. So people underestimate how much that house is really going to cost them. It's funny because I had this discussion with my wife between the cost of a house and a condo or a townhouse. And everybody, when they see, oh, the townhouse or condo has a homeowners association, they think it's bad. They're like, oh man, look at it. It's $500 for a homeowner's association. Most people think that's a bad thing. I mean, people don't see the $500 as going towards their equity. They compare two places. You have a $300,000 house and a $300,000 condo. And the condo has an extra $500 a month fee. And all they see is that's an extra monthly expense because they see it on the mortgage payment every month. Do you get any? Do you get anything for paying those fees? Yeah, it's called the convenience fee. When there's a, it's the grass mowing, the lawn, doing the lawn, doing the snow removal. Oh, there's a problem with the exterior of the house. They handle it. A lot of times, your water could be included. Maybe your internet, your TV. Some of that stuff's all included in that fee. It's the hassle factor. Oh, if the water main breaks coming into the condo, guess who handles it? The HOA? The HOA. Not you. You don't I get like a, that idea. You don't get a bill for that. But most people just see that as an expense. Oh, what about you do pest service at your house? Pest service? Yeah, where they like spray for spiders and bugs and ants. Yeah, me. Okay, well. Um, I go buy the stuff at Menards and spray. Okay, but there's a cost. Yep. How many people have come in and said, well, my pest control is $62 a month. They just don't do it. So they're underestimating what they're going to spend on a house. And one of the key things we talk about with people when they actually retire is knowing what you spend. Because when you do a financial plan, if you tell the planner you're spending 50000 and you spend 54000 it's not accurate. Yeah, and when it comes to housing, like maintaining a house, that expense is never going away. 
even if your house is paid off, right? Your mortgage might be gone, but you're still going to pay taxes. You're going to pay for upkeep, lawn service. Upkeep adds up more than people ever expect. Oh, you're going to need a new deck. You're going to need a new tree. You're going to have to replace this. Like stuff in a house wears out over time. Wouldn't it be awesome if you could build a house that was actually maintenance free for the, the time you lived in it? How would you do it? I guess if you built a metal house and you install the turf, a turf field instead of real grass, you might be able to not. Well, even at that rate, stuff's still going to break though. Like yeah. you know, the air conditioner's going to go out. We we had our washing machine go out the other night. Smoke alarms going off because the washing machine went out. It's only a couple years old. Like stuff breaks. Yeah, it's always something. <laughs> we have a buddy that's his famous line. It's always something. Um, number two, assuming Medicare has you covered. A lot of people just assume, hey, you get on Medicare, my health care's covered. Reality is you're going to need about 300000 of out-of-pocket medical expenses, not including long-term care. You know, some of that's going to be dental. Some of it's going to be medications. Um, some of it's going to be premiums to, to go towards that. So just assume that you have Medicare, that you're covered. You should still be planning for some additional expense. And then the third one, which I think people always underestimate, you can be entertained on the cheap. Yeah, there's, and this is, I think I, I'm seeing this with people that have recently, well, you see it all the time when someone transitions into retirement, you have more free time. So you do some more traveling. Um, you might golf more. You just have more time to do, to do things. You probably go out to eat a little bit more because of the convenience and the time factor. But I think, um, and this, this is probably accurate because these are the, all these say assuming these things are going to be less expensive than they are. And I, I think that's kind of um, that's that's like this says this, that's not the reality. And especially when you transition to retirement, you're not going to live as cheap as possible. But, you know, if you plan for maybe your maximum spending and see if you can stay under that, that's probably gonna give you a better opportunity. So here's why I think people struggle. One of the reasons people struggle with entertainment and retirement and the cost. 40 years they went to a job, eight to five or eight to four, they worked every day. They came home, they're probably a little tired, they ate dinner and watched a little TV, went to bed. Well, now you're retired and you wake up at eight o'clock, guess what? You don't can, have to go to work. I can go off today. I can go out for lunch. I can go meet so-and-so for happy hour. It's going to be a great day. That's exactly what happens. And there's a book called Nickel and Dimed, and it's about how people people don't squander all their money through big purchases because you're very conscious of the big purchase. If you buy a car, you know how much the car costs. But if you golf 18 holes... And then you buy a brat and you have three or four beers in the clubhouse. Packing and, a pack of M&Ms when you're headed to the back nine. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and then, oh, by the way, then you get home and your wife is done with her workout. And now she's ready to go grab a happy hour and a drink. It was like 40 bucks for the round of golf, $2 for the M&Ms, $3 for the brats, $14 for the, the beers. And then happy hours, 38 bucks. And then, oh, by the way, we probably have to get some food now. $72 at dinner. You spent $150. And then you go do that. You could easily do that every day of the week. Let's just say you did it three days a week. It's 500 bucks a week. It's 2000 a month. How many people are accounting? They're not accounting for it. So retirement's just more expensive because you're in that go-go phase. And you're not saving money anymore. And that's an expense for a lot of people, or that's not an expense, but it's part of their budget. But it's going to be very expensive when you hit the go-go phase of retirement and you start having a bunch of free time. You know, think about um, my wife. We're raising kids. I would expect that once both of my girls are in school, so you have know, got one in first grade, one in preschool. So this is the first year we've both been in school. My wife's spending is probably going to go up. A little bit because right now she's with kids all day long. She's going to have a six hour break now, not break, but five hours or six hours to go have, get all the stuff done for the house, have a little bit of personal time. There's going to be one or two days a week where we're at target and we're not usually at target. 
And we're going to have new salad bowls. Cha ching, cha ching. There you go. And, but people don't expect that in retirement. The next one the number one most expensive 401k mistake. And I like this because I think if you asked most people what the most expensive mistake in their 401k would be, they're going to tell you picking the wrong investment picking the investment that was too expensive or I was too conservative. That's going to be what they tell you was, was the number one mistake. But what's the number one mistake really, Elias? The number one mistake is just not participating and not getting the full company match. The company match could be a million dollar mistake. It if you could. were at the employer long enough. It, yeah, it very well could be. And the other part of it, and the thing I talk with clients all the time about how important it is to at least get the minimum match in the 401k, you save some of your money and instantly, let's say if you save 3%, your company is going to give you 3%. That's a 100% return on your money. And what didn't you do? You didn't make any investments. You didn't have to pick anything. All you did was you saved a little bit of money and you got a nice return for doing it. The other thing that I talk with people about is, you know, go ask them how much they get paid. And they always tell you, well, this is my salary. But if you go look at what a company says you get paid, what do they do? They add up all the benefits because the benefits is part of your pay. So if your company has a 401k with a match, and you're not doing enough to get the full employee or match, you're not getting your full paycheck. And if I told most people, well, do you want to work for 4% less? What would they say? No. No way. I'm not I want doing all that. of it. But by choice, they'll say, oh, yeah, I'm not going to do the 401k because I don't want to save 4%. You just gave up whatever the match is, the match is 4, 5, or 6. You gave up that percentage of your compensation because the employer – is planning on you doing it. They are factoring that into your overall compensation package. So just a quick statistic, the cost of skipping that full 401k match, if your company matched $1,300 roughly for your working career, and let's say you started at 25 and stayed till you were 70. So you just missed $1,300. You missed a small percentage of the match. That $1,300 over 45 years turns into 60,000. And that's just it, contributions. If you There's no it, compounded growth on that number. Well, there's we're assuming 10%. That's a one-time miscontribution of 1300. Oh, if we actually, I thought it was saying 1300. No, one time. But this is here's the 45-year turnout if you miss that 1300 every year. At a 10% rate of return, it's $960,000. Ouch. That's a lot of money to miss out on. If you would have been contributing the 1300 to get the match, so your money plus theirs, you missed out on $1.9 million. Most people, if they had $1.9 million in their account, they would be very, very, very happy with that. They would. And there's, there's a lot. There's plenty of people that probably think they would never even have that much money. But through, especially through a 401k, it's such a great savings tool. It is possible if you start young enough and you save enough money. It is possible. It's with it's. It's within reach if you have some of the right habits. So I think if you think about today, people, in my opinion, are just way more tuned into financial markets and listening to things. So I think one of the good things we can do is go over what we'll call the seven biggest investment mistakes you want to avoid. And this is according to financial experts. So they pulled a bunch of people. And the number one mistake, and I completely agree with this, is constantly watching the markets. The only people who really need to constantly be in tune with the markets are probably your financial advisor, money managers, and day traders. If you're one of these people who, and I, I know I know them, I have family members who do this. They watch CNBC all day long and think that because they're talking about all these changes that they're making in their portfolios, that they need to do the same thing in their own personal portfolio. And we've referred to this for the better part of 12 or 13 years as creating a media filter. Just filter out the media so that you're not susceptible to making a bad decision. I think it was the previous episode, Elias, you instilled the 24-hour rule. 
maybe tell us about that 24 hour rule. Cause I think that actually can help people with this actual component here. Yeah. So if you're watching, watching the markets all the time or watching financial media and you hear an idea and you think, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to implement that idea in my portfolio, wait for at least 24 hours until you do it. Wait for 24 hours, let that idea sink in and really kind of assess what you're doing, the risk you're taking. One, is it even relevant in your long-term picture? And I think if you take a moment, give yourself a little buffer between when you hear the idea and make the decision, I think over time you're gonna find you probably don't implement as many ideas and if you've been a successful investor, you probably continue to be. Mistake two, chasing trends. This has been exacerbated the last couple of years, chasing trends. The trend was, we're gonna trade options, we're gonna buy meme stocks, we're gonna buy Bitcoin. Well, all of those in 2022, they're not working. And if you chase the trend, you're losing a lot of money right now. So I actually thought that I would never hear about GameStop again. And then a month ago at a social gathering, someone asked me, so what do you think about GameStop? So of course, you know me, I'm kind of a smart Alec and it's a social get together. And I go, sir, like, are you asking me my opinion on um, retail video game sales for the future? Well, no, but just like the stock. And I go, yeah, I'm not long retail video game sales in my portfolio. Well, but what do you think about it for a trade? I'm like, I want to do it. I don't, I don't participate in that kind of, in that kind of stuff. Yeah. I bought some and I lost money doing it. There you go. You just answered your own question. You're going to appreciate this and you're going to know where I'm going with this. So didn't you have a friend who, uh, his dad was in like the workout equipment business or something? No, a, I watched a podcast about the hedge fund manager on that podcast when he grew up. Okay. He had a best friend that's dad, that his dad owned um, a business selling weight equipment. And he was very successful at it because he just always got the new hottest thing in that everyone was talking about. Okay. So the other day I was talking to someone and this person has a lot of money and uh, they were considering putting in... It not it was a small amount of money, but buying a uh, workout machine company and paying a royalty. And he asked what I thought, and I said, "Well, uh, are you going long on America getting healthy?" Yeah, and that's one of the most trendy businesses. The first thing I thought about is what you were telling me, and I I I can't give him advice on that, but he just he wanted to know if I knew a certain person and what their phone number was because he wanted advice because he doesn't live in this space. But at the end of the day, the first thing I thought about is, is the story you said, like you're going to chase a trend. And he's like, well, this thing's been out for 40 years. I'm like, well, why is he willing to sell it for that amount of money then? Like 40 years, that trend's over. Like that, that ship sailed 40 years ago. But it's the first thing I thought about. But chasing trends isn't good. People chase the Peloton trend. Yep, down 95%. The Beyond Meat trend, that's gotten crunched. You know, the whole, we're not going to eat meat anymore. I, people still do it, but the craze of having all this plant-based food, you know, I'll give you a story about Beyond Meat. My, my wife, she's pescatarian, so she doesn't eat, she'll eat fish, vegetables, but she doesn't eat red meat, chicken, any of that. Well, she tried the Beyond Meat, and she goes, I don't, like from a health standpoint, it's not really that healthy. There's more calories in this. Like she was eating a different kind of alternative hamburger. I think she eats like the Boca burger or something. We went and got the Beyond Meat. She goes, well, this is great, but there's like all these calories in this thing. Like it's not really healthier. It just doesn't have meat. She goes, I don't really see the point. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I'm going to go for something less healthy. And I thought about that. I'm like, well, other people are going to realize that just because it's plant-based doesn't mean there's not a bunch of other stuff in there that's going to make you get fat. Because most people that are plant-based, they're trying to be healthy. If you go yeah, stuff up, I don't even know how many calories is in a Beyond Meat hamburger. But she's like, this is crazy. Okay, so one patty is like 230 calories. It's only really small. They're not big patties. There's 25 grams of saturated fat, 25% of your daily value, 17% sodium. Like, my wife's like, I don't get it. She goes, it's okay. It doesn't taste that great. So 
the idea that everybody's going to buy these to get healthy. And I think you made the point. I've had stuff that tastes good. Like they don't taste bad. My wife just wanted the, the lower caloric alternative. Yeah. And when it, and when it comes to trends and then especially in the, the market and the spe- the last, certainly in 2021, it, investors were chasing these ideas and a lot of it was just fear of missing out. And here's a question you can ask yourself. If you're a retail investor and then all of a sudden this hot idea gets to you, some questions are, well, why am I hearing about this now? And then also maybe look at what the price action has been because I, there's been several times where a client asked me about an idea or a stock tip and then you go, look, well, yeah, it's run up 20% in the last 30 days. The professionals have already made this trade and made their money. By the time most of these ideas get to the retail investment level, the, the big money to be made has been made. And now you're gonna get in at a worse price point and the professionals are probably gonna start selling. It's exactly the reason we try to get people away from buying individual stocks because their risk is actually higher than the risk of buying it. You think about, and people don't really think about it this way. They think that we're all on an even playing field and we are for the most part with information. The difference is the hedge fund up in New York city, they've got 25 people. They're buying subscriptions to all of the information they can get. And that's all they're doing all day long. The average individual goes and works their job at eight to five. They get off at five o'clock to eat dinner. Like, oh yeah, I'll get on the I'll get on Yahoo Finance and or whatever blog or whatever newsletter I subscribe to, and that's how I'm going to make my investment decisions. And, and the, it, you, you've missed out. You are just better off getting in a quality index fund, getting a financial planner to help you find some actively managed stuff that's outperformed the market over a long period of time, not one, two, or five years just things that have historically done really well. We had a, a friend of mine called yesterday, wanted to buy a couple individual stocks. I said, why? Well, I think they're down in value. I said, that doesn't mean they're coming back. It's an individual stock. And the stocks, in his fairness, the stocks he gave me, one of them I believe is a really good stock. But I said, you already own it. And then it's owned in every single portfolio you have. <laughs> so why would we buy it again? <laughs> right. And it's a good stock, but it's not going to make or break his retirement. I said, what really matters is that you're making these contributions. That's it. Yeah. We'll put you in the right spot, but quit trying to pick a needle in a haystack. So a couple, three weeks ago, we had a a caller call into our live call in radio show and had a question about individual stocks and kind of said something along the lines of you guys always talk about how investors shouldn't own individual positions. Well, I just, what do you say to someone who, like me, who has been successful owning individual positions? And then he named off the stocks he has owned. But to me, kind of the question is, and the thing I start to think about, well, one, what was your return in doing that? And if you could achieve the same return in a more diversified portfolio, the same or better return, then why would you take on excessive risk if you don't have to? So that's a great point. Just because you made money doesn't mean that you wouldn't have done better buying an index or a fund that was professionally managed. Right. And his, his comment was, I've been successful doing it. Well, that's according to his parameters, right? Because who, how is he quantifying relative. success? Totally. Success is relative. Just like we talk about success in your financial plan may be different from you, one person to the next. One person, the next might need to make six and a half percent. The next person needs to make nine. And if you accomplish that goal, then ultimately you are successful. It doesn't really matter what you own if you got what you need to earn. Um, And there are people who've been successful buying individual stocks. But this takes me back to the time Warren Buffett made the bet with a hedge fund manager for, I think it was for a million dollars donated to charity. Who could, if he could outperform the stock market, outperform the S&P 500, the hedge fund manager for a year, whoever lost the bet had to give a million to charity. Guess who won? The index. Warren Buffett did. Yeah, of course he did. And there, it probably could have went the other way too, if the right market conditions would have been there. But even Warren, 
I don't think Warren Buffett does. Do they tout that they can beat the market? No. If you look at their they're not returns, trying to beat the market. They're trying to buy companies at a relative value. That's what they're trying to do. If you think about in general the way wealth's created, buying one individual stock that goes to the moon, yeah, you you can get rich and you can get wealthy doing it. Concentrated wealth in stocks. Think about the people who have concentrated positions in one individual stock. Jeff Bezos. The richest people in the world. The richest people in the world. But for all of those people, how many are bankrupt and don't have anything? A lot. A lot. The best way to get rich is save diligently in a diversified portfolio, and you'll do well. And if you can create a diversified portfolio of stock, more power to you. Most people aren't going to do better than the index, and they don't have the time, desire, or knowledge to actually want to run it themselves. Three, and this is... I think more prevalent than it's been in ever following bad advice from social media. It's everywhere. And it's, it's everywhere. And it, it seeps into every corner too. So I work at a professional investment firm. My own brother called me recently about a stock tip he heard on Facebook or TikTok. Cause that was my first question. Where did you get this information? And it was, the answer was social media. I just, I go, I don't, I don't need to hear anymore. The answer is no, but don't do it. Yeah. But if it's on the internet, it's true, right? Of course. Yeah. Go for it. <laughs> Can you believe Have a people, ball. people watch a three minute video on TikTok and believe it's true? And I am. Ha- I am happy. He called me, but you know, I'm just thinking, come on, dude, you should know better. I've talked to you about this stuff no, so many times. You know times. what he is? You're his sounding board. And we talk, we've talked about yeah. that before. People having a sounding board, you're his, hey, what do you actually think about this? And that's reasonable. That's what we're there for. If someone watches a video or something, I'd much rather have them give us a call and say, hey, yes. guys, I heard this. What do you think? It's like my friend who wanted to go to sell everything and go, go to gold and silver. I'm happy he called me. Otherwise, he just would have made a colossal mistake. Yeah, that would be. He would he would have to regret that five, ten years from now. Mistake four: not giving your investments time to grow. I've done this. I've had a nice return in things and then I sell it. And then I regret it because it kept going and going and going. I'll give you my example. The day Facebook came out, I bought it. It's like forty dollars. It got cut in half, so I bought more. A dollar cost averaged in. When it got to 55, I sold it all. <laughs> <laughs> Not a joke. I did. I'm like, oh, yeah, well, I got a nice profit. I should have just followed my, and this, you know, this is 10 years ago, 12 years ago. I should have just followed my advice and held that thing. I'd have done a lot better off just having a long term perspective, but I thought I was going to be a short term trader. I got a little spooked when I got cut in half. So then when I averaged in and tripled it. I'm like, okay, well now's the time to sell it, but just let things grow. If you're buying good companies and good mutual funds and good ETFs, things will tend to work itself out over time. So what a, what's your take on maybe money? That's not your long-term investing money, but it's like a brokerage account where you buy some stuff and you have something that's up in value and you have a purchase that you want to make. Like you have something that you want to spend the money on. How do you feel about selling out of those positions to raise I've done cash that. for things? I've done that. My brokerage account, I I mean, I'm probably a little different. I treat my brokerage account kind of as my emergency account. Like I have enough in there that even if it gets cut in half, I have enough. So I don't per se keep a bunch of cash in an emergency account. I keep it in the market. And Okay, I, right. I, so if you have a big purchase, you can find something to sell in there. And, I did it. Yeah, right, I'm going to sell the one that's within reason. I'm going right, to sell the reasonable. one that doesn't hurt me the most from a tax standpoint and try to find the one I think won't grow the most in the future. But I, that's where I save my money is in there. And then if I need to buy something, I'll go make the sale. But most people shouldn't, you know, I prepared myself that that money could get cut in half. I'm prepared to sell if it gets cut in half. I mean, I still carry a bunch of cash, but like if I need a really big purchase, you know, north of fifty thousand dollars, I'm going to go to that account and just sell it. Yeah, you also understand the risk associated with most people. With that, you know, if someone said, "Hey, I'm if I know it," and it's 
typically when it's an unknown purchase, like something is like, oh, wait, I didn't know I was going to buy that. If I know I'm going to buy it, I'm just going to have it sitting in cash. I'm not investing the money. Like, I'm just going to have it ready to go. I had a purchase last summer that six months before that, I had no idea I was going to be buying it. So I needed some cash. So I figured out what to sell. And it happened to be a good time to sell what I sold. Well, but it good. wasn't because I was trying to time a market. It was I needed some cash. So I made a sale from that account. It had nothing to do with timing the market or I think it's a good time to sell. I just need the money. And what you just said about if you know you're going to have a big purchase, you don't invest that. That's a good segue into mistake five here. Investing, Investing money, money you'll, you'll soon need. need. Yep. So this is this is really good. And this has happened a lot. Someone calls up our office and said, hey, I'm going to be buying a car. First thing I ask, how much? 40000 great. We'll put it in cash today because we know you're buying a car. Yeah, that's the prudent thing to do. Yeah, we go to cash. If we know we're going to do it, we go to cash. You know, I, I understand if the markets are down and it's not for seven months, maybe we don't go yet. But if markets are at all-time highs and you know you're buying a car in seven months, you raise the cash. Yeah. Or whatever the Look purchase for a, could be. Yeah, get a six-month CD. Do something that... You're not going to lose. And if you really need to earn some money, do some, do something like that. So don't invest money. You're going to, you know, you're going to need soon having unclear investing goals. I think this is important. We work off of goals-based planning. It could be a college planning. It could be a vacation home. It could be retirement, whatever you do, set goals for your money. And each set of goals could have different investment parameters. You know, I always use the analogy. I'm like my kid's college fund. I'm not a big proponent of target date funds. In my kid's college fund, I use target date funds. Do you know why? You don't want to have to remember to dial the risk back. Elias, and you know you know when you're going to be spending that money. I don't know how much money's in there. They just put money in. I don't ever check those accounts. And I, I think most people I talk to don't check what their kids' accounts are worth. And you know why? Know why? We don't see it as our money. That, yeah, that's exactly why. So when I set that up, I'm like, I'm never going to check this account. So I put it on a age-based portfolio. Because what I did want to have happen is, oh, yeah, by the way, Blake's 18 years old. We need the money. And the market's down 57%. <laughs> because I haven't logged into this since she was one. I literally don't <laughs> log in. It's a, It doesn't roll into my, like, you know, my screen at LPL. So it's not top of mind. I don't log in. So have goals though. My goal for that money is just, I put X amount in up front. I save X amount each month and that's to pay for college. And then once it gets to a certain amount, I'm going to stop the contributions. I'm just going to let the, you know, the earnings keep increasing it. And I, th I think there can be even, so even um, simple goals for people, right? Cause there's different stages of your investing career and it could be, you could be doing a really great job of saving and doing everything. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with making a, a new goal of, okay, well, I want to save another hundred dollars a month into a brokerage account, not a retirement account, but just a brokerage account. So then in, in 10 years, there's a big ticket item. If I want to buy it, I have a place I can get that money out and do it. Or it could be a, a goal could be as simple. If you haven't started saving, you could say, okay, I'm going to save $50 a month. I'm going to get started and save 50 bucks a month. It could be that It could be that easy of a goal to set, but just having something. And the last one, number seven, delaying investing altogether. The best day to start investing was yesterday. If you look at time value of money and, you know, we referred to the, the 401k missing match earlier in, earlier in the segment, just finding a reason to not invest, it's not good. I mean, if you think how easy it is, and we obviously want people to be investing 15% of their income, like that's what you should be doing. But if you're just starting, I don't care if it's 25 bucks, just do something. And here's one thing I've noticed, a lot of senior investors, just people like 60 years and older that have families and kids and grandkids, the, the folks who have done a really good job saving they know it's important and they want to get their kids and grandkids started early but then even people who maybe haven't done as good a job because they got and started investing like later when they were 50 years old or whatever the situation is a lot of times they comment 
you know, I really need to have my kids come meet with you guys. They're just started their first job. They're 25. I just want them to realize what a hundred bucks a month could do for them over the long term. So I think, and to me, that's always, I think everyone has that at some point where you, you know, you, you get, you start, but then you always think no matter when you start, you always think, gosh, I wish I would have started five years earlier, 10 years earlier, 15 years earlier. We are, we all are going to look back and have regrets about what we've done. The good news is we can change what we're doing for the future. I want to thank everybody to listening for listening to this episode. If you're looking for help, you can go to btwellshow.com, click get help. Elias, I want to thank you and hope everybody has a great weekend. (laughs) 